Coming up upstairs also, uh, somebody found some bins up there that had dollar uh, finial material in it, so I think they're still up there searching through that, but let's get started. Uh, this lady told me to introduce her as Merrill of Merrill Lynch and Company. <laughs> so if you, if you want to, she, yeah, she's independently wealthy, she says. <laughs> Merrill's been around a long time. And at one time, she had a short stint as the president of AAW. She was smart enough to get out of there <laughs> for too long. But she, uh, I've seen a lot of her turnings, and she does a beautiful job. And I'm going to just turn it over to her from now on. On. Yep. Can you hear me? Um, I'm going to start with slides, but let me just introduce myself. I always like to do a disclaimer um, about my churning is that I started in, I went to design school and I studied environmental design and uh, furniture design and Italian design. And what I really wanted when I was younger was to be an Italian designer. But I had three children at the time at home that made it very difficult to be an Italian designer in Southern California. Um, and then I went to, I gave myself a sabbatical thinking I was going to go to architecture school. And I enrolled in a wood program in Cal State Northridge. And I just never left. And I got a degree in art and wood. So I always like to give the disclaimer that I never knew about wood turners when I started. It was just, I went to wood school. And, um, and so that's the excuse for what I make <laughs> <laughs> and how I turn. And that was another thing, it was really funny. When I, I moved to San Francisco in 19, I don't know, in the late 70s. And um, a friend of mine shared a shop with two furniture makers. And they said, don't I know about these wood turning groups? Like Dale Nish was already having his conferences. And so I went to a conference there and I brought two pieces. I'll show you the picture of one of them, uh, which nobody knew what to make of. And, and the worst thing was that people asked me whether I cut or scraped. I had no idea what they were talking about. <laughs> What is cutting or scraping? And it turned out I scraped, which just put me down at the bottom of the heap <laughs> for a long, long time. Um, so that's how I learned how to do lots of stuff. And then eventually, I went to England and decided amongst those English turners, they were terrifying. I better learn how to use the gouge. And so I did. <laughs> And now I don't know how I ever scraped some of those paper-thin bowls that I did. It's hard to imagine. But anyway, so let's show slides so you have a better idea of what I've done. And then I'm going to demonstrate just a couple of carving things and one finish tonight. If you come on Saturday, we'll spend a lot more time on different finishes and dyes. I'm sorry about my voice. Oh, I don't want that one back. I'm going to sit down. Oh, no, so I, no, this, oh, we want to go back one. I thought it worked on here. Let me try. No, it's not working. I'm sorry. I'm still, unfortunately, backwards. Oh, forward? Okay, now. I know, I'm, I'm, I'm in the dark ages. I have some of my stuff digitized, but not enough. Uh, let's try now. Okay. This is actually the first thing I ever turned. Um, I was in art school, and um, part of the training was that you used every machine in the wood shop. You had different projects, you know, for making joints, 
to shaping wood to turning was one of them so that you would the word in in art school is vocabulary you'd have a larger vocabulary so that you could design better if you knew how to do all these different things and i had come from design school and i didn't i wanted to make something that was functional and i wanted to make something that maybe i could use myself and i had also, between when I graduated UCLA, I took in my sabbatical, before I took the woodworking, I took a Chinese cooking class and a French cooking <laughs> class. I do love to cook. And so I made myself a set of rice bowls. Then there was a big competition in California, um, and I put the bowls in there, and I made a box for it. There's only five bowls in here, and there are six in the other picture, because one of them kept breaking. Um, and uh, it got into this really good show, and then I thought I'd price it so high that no one would buy it. A whole $400 for the set, and this gallery bought it from, um, New from Scottsdale. What happened? Oh, okay, that's right, I forgot we're on a stack floater. Oh, I don't know if it did. It doesn't matter, really. Um, I don't know if any of you have ever seen this piece. This was a giant set of barbells I turned. And it's four feet wide. The wheels are 25 inches and about five inches thick. Um, I did a whole series of pieces based on this. I was working with octagonal form. You know, I'm in art school. <laughs> This is a detail of the spoke. I found out later that these are, of course, not barbells. They're weights, and they come apart. Uh, but what did I know? And then at the time, I saw this movie of Arnold Schwarzenegger, which is rather embarrassing now. It was called Pumping Iron, and I fell in love with him. <laughs> and my husband had a photo lab and used to, one of the Pumping Iron magazines used to send their pictures through. So he used to get me photographs to draw in I art school. So this was called Barbells for Arnold. <laughs> and then I did this jelly donut. And this is the one I took to Dale Nish. So uh, it did bring out quite a reaction. Like, what is that? It's 14 inches across. And I poured the polyester resin in place and then turned the whole thing. You know, when you don't know what you're doing sometimes, you just go and do it. <laughs> then um, I s decided I, ha I never could sell any of my large sculptural pieces. And when I moved to San Francisco, I shared a studio in the city, and I really needed to make some money. Um, and so I started doing craft shows and doing sets of bowls. Uh, and I also started teaching a furniture design class at the time. So these pieces are, I did a whole series of rice bowls, you know, that, that ja the Chinese cooking and Japanese cooking. Uh, and these are the first pieces I dyed black. So this is early 80s. And part of the reason I went black is I felt like so many furniture makers in particular at that time, and even wood turners, were more interested in the wood and the grain and not into the form. It's just like they didn't really look at the shape they were doing. And so by dyeing something black, you only had the form to think about. Uh, and then I did a whole series of uh, trays and bowls, like sushi trays and bowls. Um, just odd things, <laughs> you know. This is a piece of laminated walnut and maple that I got from a gunstock maker. I used to get a lot of gorgeous wood from this guy. And I did a bunch of tables also. This is one of them. It, it has three tops. Everything's turned. At the time, I was told like to get into some of the e exhibitions or competitions that, well, lots of people know how to turn. I knew how to make furniture, and so why don't I enter furniture? And I get, if I'm challenged, 
I'll go out and try to meet it somehow, like come up with something being silly. So that's what this one was. It was the, I, I can't even remember what I called it, but it has three tops, three legs, you know, it was just everything triad. <coughs> and then this is another table, which is a large platter. It's about 30 inches across. That's based on, you know, the Mexican stool that folds up and also starting to play with more colored finishes. I don't know if you can see that in here. Whoops, that one didn't work. What happened? Should we try again? I probably should have brought my own carousel, huh? We're using a stack loader because who has carousels anymore? Me. Um <laughs> Oops, okay. Well, that's all right. Uh, and so these are the legs folded up. And my concept was that the platter could hang on the wall, you know, because it's textured and, and colored finish. And then the legs could fold away. And then if you had, you know the old, I don't know how many of you remember, but the toll trays, that concept that certainly in the 50s, my generation, that you would serve tea and you'd bring out this tray and then set it up on legs. And so it's all sort of based on all these things. Then in somewhere in the 80s, I was doing a lot of dyed plates, just starting to play with color. And one of the things with color, which we'll talk about more, is that if there's a scratch in your piece, that color is going to find that scratch and it's going to stand out like a sore thumb. And so when I took this piece off the lathe, finished it completely, and then put color on it, it had this, these horrible sanding scratches in the middle. Uh, and I was just sort of staring at it. And I've always lived in an area where I have a lot of furniture makers and other artist friends nearby. And a friend came wandering in and said, well, can't you do something to that? center, do something to the material. And I had a Dremel, a, an old one that a friend had given me, and I thought, well, maybe I could just texture that surface. So this was the first piece I ever textured. So I think it was like 87. Um, and it, it was put into a show by the Wood Turning Center in Philadelphia. So I've been very lucky about getting into shows now this is, we're going to do a little of this tonight. These are, a uh, neighbor dropped a packing crate in front of my house. And it turned out it was all hardwoods. Oh, and maybe five to six inches across. I had a lot of that wood. I did what I call the recycled packing <coughs> crate plates for quite a few years. And just carved different patterns on them, burn it black. Because the funny thing with this crate, the wood wasn't all the same color. I don't even know what some of the oak was, but different kinds. One, one of the pieces smelled so bad that a furniture maker friend of mine said it was piss oak. <laughs> 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 he claims there is such a wood, uh, but we d I don't believe him. <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah, <I'm> right. <laughs> Uh, I don't know that you can see, but this texture, and I might have a picture of it, is done with an angle grinder with like a 36 grit sanding disc, like on a five inch disc. And if I hold it and move it at the right thing, I can get an absolutely even spiral. And that concept of that rough parts, um, rough parts accept more color I can start playing with color, and we're going to do some of that, where I can play and, and get one color over another. Yeah, and there's a, just a picture of grinding an edge. Uh, this is another texture, just which I'll do on Saturday on, on the lathe. A lot of my stuff's done off the lathe. So this is just a very simple piece. Um, I think it's ash dyed black and done the lines. I do a lot of sort of simple lines. 
my work in some ways, you know, is left over. I think I've been accused, you know, from where I grew up with the 50s minimal and 50s design. Um, I have a young furniture friend in my neighborhood who has been buying up these old 50s furniture, and I go, I had the original. <laughs> you know. Uh, this is also done with an angle grinder and one of those carbide burrs, and I just go slash across the piece, and it's walnut, and then I'll put black glaze on it. So I start getting these ancient, I, I seem to like these pieces that look really old. Uh, this is all dremeled and just a white glaze on it. This is a large disc that I don't have it up on, the, on this slide, but it hangs by aircraft cable, and it's carved all the way around four sides, and it's three inches thick in the middle, and I taper it down to about a half inch. Um, and it's just a free-hanging disc that you can just walk around. And this finish on here, but you can't see that, it's graphite over black just powdered graphite with beautiful finish. And then sometimes I add like with colored pencils or with pastels, um, just color here and there. So it's sort of a surprise, like from far it looks black. When you get close, you start seeing lots of detail. I've had over the years between my husband who had heart disease and I had back problems. So I was out of work for a long time here, you know, it, it would come and go, but at one point I was out of work almost two years, really. And I would always take art classes because I go crazy, painting, drawing, something, until I could stand long enough in the studio. And I found it just changed my colors. I start doing more of layering colors and mixing colors than I ever did before I, I painted. So the same piece that had the square, I started thinking about putting things into the square. And this one's called Forbidden Fruit. And I have this paint I use. That, that I, there's a piece over there with this rusty paint. It looks very ancient. And I just build a shelf into a turned disc and then put something in it. I've done quite a few of these. And then just carve a disc, I don't know. I think part of my, I, I started thinking about that. Uh, for a while, all I did was sort of flat plates, and I think that really was a result of my back. I bought this short bed lathe in England, a graduate where I can just stand right in front of it, and, you know, because I couldn't bend. Now I started, like, with the small pieces. When I do these large discs, those corners become all my small bowls. That's what all of these are over here. They're left over from big pieces. I don't waste anything. Um, and so this one's called Moon Over Marsh. I used to live next to a salt marsh and would watch, you know, walk by it every day and watch the tidal action. And it was just a beautiful sight. And just the textures in the water. I don't deliberately do it. it it's later when I start looking at all my work, I see, wow, that's what I'm doing. Um, then this is the period right after my back surgery. I did these, re I was grounded in bed for three months. I had major, major surgery. And so my husband used to bring me breakfast or dinner. I could get up for a couple meals. Um, and so I did a breakfast tray you know, in just maple. And I did an apple a day. <laughs> and this piece was because the original barbells went to the Smithsonian. And my son, Mr. I call him Mr. YMCA. He's been in the YMCA his whole career, um, probably almost 25, 30 years. So he always thought he should get the barbells because he was Mr. YMCA. Uh, and then when he got the job here in Colorado, um, I decided to make him a full-scale size of bar you know, the dumbbells here. And, of course, in my mind, he was going to display them at the Y, and then maybe I'd get commissions. 
But no, they're in his living room. <laughs> <laughs> so he still has them, and when I come here sometimes, I have to oil them because they don't take care of it. <laughs> Kids, oh, this is upside down, but this, this is for the, you know, when we the AAW had the bat show? And I was a juror for that show, and I decided they told us we could each make a bat. And so I made the triple B bat, or, you know, Barry Bonds bat, or the big bad bat. And it's so it's really heavy. It's from that laminated wood that I had before, the maple and walnut. And I put that awful rust paint with graphite on the handle, so you really don't want to hold it. <laughs> And uh, this was so exciting because the Louisville Museum, Slugger Museum, bought it. And I have grandsons who play baseball. You know, this is pretty cool that I have a bat there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is a large piece that I do I, it to show you. I turn outboard a lot on a floor stand. I have a one-lay lathe, finally. I won a grant in California because I could never bring myself to spend five grand for a lathe. Um, but then I got the grant, and so that sort of paid for half of it. And um, so this is a piece that I are I'm going to split. So it has a waste block in the middle. And here it's cut out. And then I did a whole series of these kinds of discs. I get bored, I think. I have to move on. Um, this is uh, just with milk paint, and that's the turning, the tool marks that just left from coming down the disc. And then I started with the corners, started utilizing my corners and big plates. This is a piece I call the planets, and it's quilted maple bleached, and then all the little leftovers just put into the middle of the bowl. So that one was about 20 inches across. This is ash. And then from whatever scraps I have, I just fill it up with all this is autumn, all the different colors of autumn. And, and I just I love experimenting. It starts being a game with me with the next few pieces. So I did this as a tower of bowls. It's over six feet tall. And it's 15 bowls. And I started the only thing that's the same is that the opening in each box is four inches by four inches. So the piece has to fit in there. Other than that, every one is different. And it really becomes a game. Like, what can I do to this piece to make it different? Or what can I experiment? In fact, I almost thought I should do that. Maybe the white one towards the bottom is a pistachio uh, shell finish that we did once at a silly furniture conference and you glue on the pistachio shells all over the outside and then you paint it. And it's quite a lovely finish. <laughs> so I've done, you know, um, this is the only tower I've ever done. Uh, I did a boat of bowls. And here's some of the bowls from the boat. And I did this wall of bowls. Uh, this is based on an English potter's bowl, uh, Hans Koper, that I loved his work. I have several books of his ceramics. And I just start playing with it, like taking one shape and then saying, what can I do to the base? What can I do to the scale? Can I make it taller, smaller? And part of that is left over from design school where they would give you exercises where like for a ceramics class once, we started with a cube and changed it through a series of steps so that you could see the progression, but you couldn't tell the first one, the last one, of how they were related. Um, and I guess I like giving myself these little projects. And this is a detail of one of the bowls. Um, and this I was going to demonstrate Saturday is it's a red dye with black over it, and it just tones it down. You can do a lot with glazes. Um, you can really, I find, it's my own personal, you know, it's subjective, but I can't stand, frankly, some of the really bright 
gaudy colors straight out of the the bottles. They just look awful to me. Uh, but that's my taste. And so I like to start altering them and tone them down and just make them look a little more subtle. Uh, this was a set I did for, um, I did a, that wall series and then I did this for the ambassador in Fiji. There's a program called Art, what is it called? Embas Art and Embassies. And it's quite a big program. It's been around a long time. And the Fiji ambassador's wife or something saw my work at a show and wanted me to be in their collection of American art. And so I did these pieces for them. And I was really lucky they brought me over to Fiji, the State Department. It's kind of funny to say the State Department sent me to Fiji. Uh, and But I worked. I didn't lounge on the beach. I worked hard for my week, um, really hard. Uh, but it was a wonderful experience. And this was their set. And that's it. That's the last piece. So how's our time? Good. So let's get this back to you. getting harder. <laughs> it's getting really harder. But I have like really strange. I sort of like a big disc. I have lots of roll carts. So it goes on a cart and I'll have my face plate on it. And then I tilt it up. I might have a I want to get now a lift so I can get it to the right height. So I get it as close as I can, tilt it up and get it on. Now the sad part is, like, I was doing reverse chucking and putting it in a one-way chuck. And when my husband was alive, he was the best. Um, what was it? Tim from One Way said to me, you lost your gopher. You're, or in England, they call it dog's body. He said, you lost your dog's body, did you? Because <laughs> I told him he needs to invent some way on outboard to be able to um, you know, sort of really help you get it in there. Because I don't like his table. I'm too short for that outboard table on the one way. Um, I always feel like I'm going to fall over it. And that's why I like a floor stand. I can get much closer. Um, the problem is moving. The, that's getting harder, too, moving the floor stand around. But I have seen, like... Um, do you have Craig and Auto Parts or something? Or actually, what was the company? It isn't. It wasn't Rockler. There's another company that does sell some, you know, for auto stuff, lifts. And Granger has some stuff too. And um, so I think I have to. I'm going to have to do that. And then I've changed some of my mounting techniques. One thing nice when you're outboard is I can turn. I can reach around and turn both sides. So if I I draw a lot, so if I plan out how I'm mounting it, you know, I can just mount it from one side and then clean up afterwards. Do whatever I want. You can route off the bottom. I mean, there's all kinds of things you can do to solve your problems. Um, that was the thing I always felt was so great about design school, was that they didn't teach you how to do anything, but they sort of taught you some skills in that you want to solve this problem, you go out and figure out or research or you figure out how to do it somehow. And um, it's a great advantage, really. Mm. Spilling water all over myself. All right, so I'm going to talk a little bit about, I have tonight carving. So what I was going to show you is I do a lot of drawing. I know woodturners don't draw. Um, it's, it's a strange thing. And when they draw, they draw silhouette, half silhouette. And I never understand how you can really visualize a bowl and a half silhouette. It just doesn't make any sense to me. And I, I'm not a good drawer. I'm, I'm a terrible drawer. But I've drawn enough bowls over the year. Can you see this? So, like, let's say I want to do, like, one of those bowls. I usually just start with an oval. I mean, they're messy, my drawings. And then I have a foot. 
and I do something like that. Or we're going to do a texture on this little thing tonight. So I might, you know, just like to get ideas. I might just draw circles, 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 and start saying, like, some I've done. Can you, can you see this? <laughs> OK. And then I'll go back and forth and make patterns. I'm really not into detailed carving. I've, I, I, that's, that's my other. I've never turned a hollow vessel, a pen. What else haven't I done? There are a lot of things I haven't done. I, it's very f <laughs> <laughs> You will? OK. My husband has turned pens. <laughs> You know, so I might start laying out patterns. You know, like maybe I want straight lines here, and I want dots here, and I want something here. And it's, it's just very rough. And then something will strike me, and that's what I want to do. It's um, like if you take my class when I've taught at Anderson Ranch, I am making you draw, I'm sorry to say. So that maybe that's why nobody wants. This summer I didn't have enough students. Uh, but I do force people to just practice sketching um, and also collecting. Um, I think a lot of the wood turners are doing that now, where you get yourself a journal and you get yourself a library where you start p collecting pictures and ideas from magazines or uh, art books or things you've seen. It's just a really good way to develop your eye. So I could come up with. Maybe I just want lines, and they all go different ways. But I mean, I'm not good at it. The other thing that I've learned how to do, because I've always worked with dry wood coming from furniture, is I will plan it out. So let's say I have a block that's four inches approximately by four inches. And I know that I'm going to want to mount it on you know, chucks are fairly new for me. I always did face plates and reverse chucking. Do any of you ever do that with, you know, you have a waist block on a piece? Like, let's see. Here's my face plate, and then I have a waist block. So I would make a fit to fit my bowl in. So it would center it. Chucks are so much easier. I mean, when I got my first chuck, I thought, oh my gosh, this is a miracle. But I don't think they even had them when I started, unless you got the machinist trick. <coughs> so I, I'll plan out, like even for a big disc, let's say I have, we're going to make believe this is 20 inches. And I, I only have two inch wood, so I have a problem there you know, in terms of what I can do. It isn't like I design the whole thing out perfectly, but I do want to know, like I'll have my center line, and that let's say I can have a, a six-inch base to fit into a chuck, or sometimes I've actually glued on, glued on a waist block so that I can mount it and have room to play with. Um, Actually, I think that one slide that I showed you, I don't know if you remember, with the purple, um, that piece I actually ended up going through. It was so thin. It was a recycled bookshelf. So it was so thin that I, I went through to make it look like there was a deeper bowl. And just by adding on and plan planning what you're going to do, you can hide the fact that it isn't a solid piece. So I would plan out and then know I need my curve, whatever my curve is. Um, the piece that has the shelf in the middle gets turned opposite. It goes down away from the top of the bowl where the shelf is going to go in here. Um, so I will plan out how I'm going to do that. And I, I have an idea uh, from like this kind of thing, what I might want to do to it. Um, but it's very rough and rudimentary. I know that some of the guys I know, they just they design it as they're on the machine. Um, 
and I do for some things. Okay, so I was going to talk first about the carving. We've got two pieces here we'll work on. So I do use the angle grinder a lot. Um, I did just buy a Proxon, which is really nice. It's very lightweight, though. Um, the Fordham, I use the Fordham quite a lot. And a Dremel. And usually I'll have the Fordham for carving and the Dremel for sort of cleaning up. Um, I will try out, we can pass some of these around. Um, some of these are parts of pieces that I've made, so I'm trying out textures. This was a large oak platter, and I'll try textures and color on here. Then I'll go to work on the piece. So if you want to pass some of these out, there's probably more carving on the back. I had a commission for a bank in um, Wachovia, which I guess doesn't exist anymore, does it? Um, in North Carolina, and it was a huge piece, like four and a half feet, and the people were really fussy about color. So I kept sending them, FedEx was loved us, back and forth samples, till we finally agreed on as close as I could get it, color. So I will try out tools on here and colors, it, uh, um, just to play with, to get an idea. So I don't know if you want to just keep passing. Yeah. Uh huh. Some of them, like here, these do. They don't all, and it's bad. <laughs> but um, I used to do these very small little plates with pastel, which we'll talk about later, with pastel fabric dyes, and I was doing the craft shows. And so I had to standardize then, and then I came up with a formula, and I just mixed that formula for every color so I knew what I had. I don't know how many of you know Wendy Moriyama, this furniture maker? I went over to, she used to be in the Bay Area, and I went there once to get some, ask her some color questions about what her paint was. And um, she kept copious notes on her furniture because um, in case she got something back that she could repair it. Part of the thing with mixing colors, if you're doing one of a kind pieces, you know, you're just going to go mix for that piece. It doesn't matter. It's when you start doing duplicates or you think you might run into a problem like on a commission where I might have to repeat it or fix it. Then I want to keep my notes. So I do on some, not all of these. I have on the back what I've done. Um, and then I have some small samples. This one, let me, yeah, does it say? Yeah, so this is just a little pen knife and bronze. So let's, are they getting back there? They will. So here's just a couple more samples. This is the one we're going to work on tonight is black with blue over it. But first we're going to carve. So let's go back there. So I find uh, for carving, here's another piece. This piece is a failure, but it's worth looking at. And then somebody can tell me, well, it's been burnt so many times that it's just a mess. So I always try my texture. I'll have some sample boards. Uh, what I do a lot, but I didn't bring them, they're too hard. It's like if I'm cutting a big platter, you know, besides saving what I can for a bowl, I'll try, wow, I'll try to save the wood that I'm using for my piece for my sample. Um, but if I'm trying new, uh, Okay, <laughs> um, if I'm trying new carving patterns, then I would try it on a board. I would try the color on the board, the texture on the board. 
uh, and then go to my piece. So let's say I want to, I want um, this one, I'm just going to use a small pattern. I'm, I'm going to do just like the straight lines on here. So let's talk about some of the bits. One of the things is some of these things make, some different bits will make the same pattern. You know, it doesn't matter what you're using. But let's try some of these out, and then you can just see what they do. Oh, that's, yeah, great. Yes, let's do that. Um, when I talk about finishing, almost more than my carving, I, I talk about safety. And, um, but, yeah, wait a minute, I'm getting, I'm getting lost. So let me just do this. First is carving. So I don't know what you all use. Uh, I bought this when I had this commission because all my carving tools really, were the patterns were too small, you know, so there's scale involved in what you're doing. Um, my whole thing with texture is to create a base because I love the color and I can use it for color. It's contrast to a simple shape. Um, I don't, how many, any of you do, do how many of you do carving and texture? Yeah. Yeah, now I mean like I'm not, as I said, I've never done, I don't do flowers. I'm, um, I don't do little, that kind of carving. It's more about just pattern and texture. So this, this cutter, do you all know this Arbitec covered cutter? There's several versions of this kind. Like I have one that has like, it's a chainsaw blade around it. Um, and they, when I lived in England, they had a large one like that. And some people think they're really dangerous. The, I love this little Arbitec. I use this a lot. But I do use it in a larger grinder than this one. I'm going to work on the oak. So right now I'm pulling up the grain like mad. Can you see that? It's tearing. So let's try the opposite direction. Yeah, much better. Hmm. It's not doing what I want. So that's why I try it out. What I want to do is big scoops. Great big scoop. It might be, that's why I think they have to be faster, and this is about as fast as this will go. So I haven't used the Arbitec cutter in the Proxon. I don't think it's powerful enough to do, take away the meat that I want to take. Um, so I might switch over to some other tool. You know, I'll try that, and that's like a, not what I want at all. Um, so I started with Dremel cutters. You know, just the ordinary kind of round, sharp ones. Uh, and then someone introduced me. Do you all know these rotary chisel ones? They're these um, triangular shape with their carbide cutters. They're fantastic. Um, but these are quite large. We don't have a quarter inch chuck here for it. Uh, the small one does just about the same as this, almost the same, but it's cleaner. So I'll show you that. And this, of course, can go in your Dremel. 
it can go into this Fordham. Is the Fordham plugged in? No, I don't think so. And I'm going to put one in here. Okay, great. Thank you. So let's put this in the Fordham. Uh, the only engraver I have is the little $3 one, the cheapie that you buy. And I have used that. But if it depends on what I'm after. Oh, this is really strange. Doesn't go in very far. That's a little scary. I'll tell you why. This is as far down as I can get that with that much shaft showing. Um, it, it could split. I mean, it can just break, snap off. I really want to get that down uh, probably another quarter of an inch. So I'm not going to take a lot of meat off with this. And then we'll put this one in here. Yeah. This, I know that they sell this, I don't know if maybe they sell it at Rockler, I don't really know. But this one is from a guy in, um, he's Wyoming, and I bought mine direct from him. Um, and I don't know if he, if he, does he still sell direct to you? Yeah, he's a really nice guy. Um, and they're not cheap by any means. I think these big ones must be over 50 bucks. Don't you think? I thought they were. Uh, but compared to, like, when I used to use these before I kept, you, the whole concept is you start low and keep building up, get more and more expensive tools. Or what my shop partners used to say, each new job you got, you could buy a new tool for. So then the way you build your shop up. Um, but this is a carbide one. I used to use one or two per big disc and then have to toss them. They'd be worthless. But this I can use over and over again. And with a little diamond sharpener, I can sharpen it. You know, just those little flat, inexpensive. Although those are getting hard to find, too. The little ones that were like $5 flat at Home Depot or something like that. So let's try this. And I would... You know, let's say I have an idea for a piece, but I'm not quite sure what I want to do. I would play like this. I mean, now that I've done so many, I know we don't have a way to hold it, but we have you. <laughs> okay. Whoops. That's not working. Is there an on and off switch here? Yes, there is. There we go. But will it lay? It won't lay flat there. How can we do that? That's reverse. That's reverse. I want forward. I don't have reverse. That's a thing. So let's go. So I can make just dots. Do you know Haley Smith? Haley and I met when she was like 19 years old, living in when I was living in England. And we always pick on each other because I cannot do it the way she does, which is these perfectly round things at all. I kind of am free like I have a piece of charcoal pencil. And we're always like looking at each other's work or picking on each other. Like I know the thing that could get Haley upset is she'll ask me what I think of something and I go, it's just so anal, Haley. <laughs> 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 
Or she'll say, you know, like, mm, you could clean that up a little bit. So I could do that. So I might try a couple of things to find out what it is I want to do. Um, let's see, we're going to unplug that one. My new shop, I have a new shop. I moved and I have a gorgeous new shop. And I got this really fabulous strip in the, you know, I have like that, that hollow on the, on the workbench, the old, you know, the lower section. And we ran this fabulous um, strip, power strip. It's just so nice. Because this shop, my lathe is in, the, I mean, my, my workbench is in the middle of the room, and I couldn't use all the wall plugs, but it works beautifully. So I'm going to try a couple of cutters, and then I'll decide what I want to do. But I am doing it on an oak piece, so let's try some more here. Now, the cutters really need high speed. They don't cut low speed. Let's try it here. I think it's dull. Yeah. No, I see that. Let's slip in. You're not kidding. I've had them. I had no only once I had one in my Fordham that slipped and then it just snapped. And the guy in Wyoming wanted it back because I called him and um, he said he he just wanted to see it. He had never had one done. But I had a Sorby turning tool once that the, I guess whatever their steel was wasn't good and it just split in half. Okay, so I th I'm going to try one other tool, and then I'm going to carve this, and then we'll add some color. <coughs> so I think I'm going to put it in here. Um, I want to draw sort of hard rough lines on here. So I like this flat top and I just use the edge of it. This is so funny, there's a bottom to this thing. Okay, but I'm going to try it on here first. Oh, whoops. Huh? Okay. Yeah, I'm going to use that one. You got it? Okay, so what I'm going to do is carve half of this plate with this, so with this one. Okay, so I've decided after doing that that I want to carve that, and I'm, I want to use that tool. Uh, and then I lay out, and one of the things, whether I'm doing large pieces or small, these flexible see-through rulers, it's metric on one side, inches on the other, is a great way to lay things out because, you know, you can see through what you're doing. And it's because it's flexible, I can lay it down into my piece. 
They're really nice. You can get them at any art supply store. Um, and I keep soft pencils, very soft pencils, uh, because then they don't leave a scratch in my piece, and they erase very, very easily. So let's see. So one thing I can do, depending on my grain, um, I might want to, you know, the long grain's running this way. I might want to go cross grain and carve that way. And I find I have some really bad, I don't know what it is, motor control, but whenever I start carving lines, um, I find they go off at an angle, and so I have to give myself some guidelines to keep me straight. Um, I had a kid, though, who came to help me at one time, and he wanted to see if he could do it straight. And he could, and he's stronger than I, and he got really deep. And the funny thing is I hated it. It was like too perfect. Um, it was just, it was really funny. So I might just do that, and because I have these see-through lines, I can lay this on and know that I'm going to be perpendicular because I can see. And maybe all I need is a couple of lines just to keep me on track. So let's see how fast we can do this, okay? somewhere the things which we have but we're not going to be able to I don't know how we'll have to set up for Saturday is sometimes if I'm doing that it really tears up tears up the wood and there's a couple of ways to clean up one cheating is to torch it you torch off those fi those loose fibers and then I I love the torch I have a piece over there that's black with the that rust paint and that's been burnt um I think we'll try to do that on Saturday. Um, you have to be careful torching that you don't completely crack up the piece. Some woods work better. Oak burns beautifully. Um, or another thing that I've developed, and I've gone through a million ways to clean it up, are wire brushes. Now, this one, I know a lot of you might know that 3M, um, fiber, you know, it's plastic impregnated, but I find it sands too much, and that's not, sometimes I don't want that. Uh, it'll sand my surface and, and soften the edges where I don't want the edges softened. So, I mean, I've gone through everything. Um, let's see. Here, a wire brush, and then what happens to it on a big piece? There's no wire left. <laughs> Even 
having changing the seeds. So I've done that. Here's another. I bought these very expensive wire brushes one time. I've, you know, you go into a store, you're traveling. So these are German. I thought, that'll do the trick. It says X number RPM. That'll do it. But they didn't hold up very well. And now I found the best is using these scotch brights, And I save them from when I clean up surfaces. I cut out little circles. <laughs> um, because even if they're worn out here, the edge is still good. And these will wear out also. I think I have, yeah, you can see this is what happened to one on a big piece. But um, I'm getting dual use out of a scotch bright pad. But I find these work really well, and I can, I'll put it in s the Dremel. So sometimes I'll be using the Fordham. That's the height of, it's like the height of decadence over the years, how I've uh, started working. So I'll have the Fordham here, the Dremel to with the cleanup. That's like I have two lays. I have the big one way the 24 inch one, and then I have my little graduate. And so sometimes like for small bowls, I'll do the outside the on the one way, walk over to my graduate and turn out the inside, then go back to the one way and turn off the bottom. And then once in a while I think, God, I've gotten so spoiled. <laughs> you know, but you just start accumulating, why not? Um, I, oh, you, let's see if I have an empty shaft. You can buy these, <coughs> like, uh, threaded, they're shafts that have the screw in the end. Have you ever used those? Uh, they're just, they don't come with anything, but they just have a threaded thing. And then I can, because I know they make, um, Dremel makes these ones that are like a for scotch bright for cleaning up, and it comes with the threaded so you can change the head. But I think they're just way, they wear out after one job, and they're so expensive. Um, I'm from the era of <laughs> make use. Like I was uh, kidding with my daughter in law today about you know how you save money and figuring out prices in stores. And I said, well, that's how I did it for years. This was my budget. I could only spend X amount of food, you know, money on food for the kids. That's how we did it. And uh, now the young people are just learning how to do that, I think. So I would come in here and clean this up at, at a lower speed. Because when you're doing any of the wire brushing, it wears out too fast at a higher speed. I bought this, I still have the old crummy, like 40 year old Dremel, uh, because I have a little router attachment and this one doesn't fit in that. But this is really nice, it doesn't, some of them get too hot. And this one's a, a newer electronic, heavier weight and it doesn't get hot in my hands. Um, so I would go in there and just clean up those loose fibers And sometimes, no matter how careful I am, when I shine a light on or I put a die on, I'll see I haven't carved it evenly. And then you'll want to go back and re-carve it. I usually double check myself several times. And I thought I had a vinyl eraser here somewhere. Um, wonder what I did with that. Well, we're going to make believe I had a vinyl eraser here and would erase that line and get rid of it. Um, but I can see now, just the way the light hits it, that I've missed some edges here and some close to my line. And I would want to go back and clean that up. I always think that, um, you know, the it's the details and the finishing is what makes a piece. You know, you can do 
the most beautiful turning in the whole world. And if you have a messy finish on, it's, it's going to just ruin the whole thing. And so you really want to concentrate on looking at uh, small things. You know, even though what it's like um, organized chaos in a way. You know, I'm trying to look free and loose, but it has some tightness that I'm, I'm, I'm really watching how I'm going to do it. So this piece, what I want to do is mix up some black dye. Um, and I have two kinds of dye with me tonight, and I'll talk much more about them on Saturday. But um, there's aniline dye, and for a, a while there, people were saying, do not use aniline dye because it's dangerous. Because the old aniline dye, what the word meant was, um, God, all of a sudden I've lost that word. Oh, I hate that. Um, it was coal, coal, you know, this, uh, and it's dangerous to breathe that stuff. But they're really not anymore. They're all chemically produced dyes, and they're made in dye houses. And, and it's a matter of, so this one is made for, you know, wood, uh, th that kind of aniline dye. Then I have, this is called fiber reactive. It's a fabric dye, but it's made for cellulose fibers. So wood is a cellulose fiber, and you can use that. And this one, I, the <coughs> thing is with fiber clothing dyes, you get a whole range of other colors that you don't get in the wood dyes. Um, but tonight, I'm just going to do, whoops, what happened here? Where is it? It felt, it feels like it's killing me. <laughs> Oh, that's it. Okay. Fell out of my pocket. Okay, let's do that because it was pulling down. Okay, are we set? Can you still hear me? Yes, okay. Um, so I'm going to use a black alcohol base. Um, and, and fiber reactive is water base. I do have some handouts, but we will talk. I put something on finishing. It's going to be on the, your website. Maybe it's already on that I sent to uh, Henry. Um, and uh, depending on what I'm doing, I'll use either. The reason I prefer alcohol is that it dries instantly, and I don't have to seal it. You use in a, in a different way. I don't have to use you know really solid sealer. You use a water dye. It's going to water spot unless you seal it with lacquer, something that's going to be impervious to water. But what I'm going to want to do because I've done this textured surface. Oops, my eraser. It's really bugging me. Um, is that? Huh? Is it in here? Great, thank you. And my, my ear things. Okay, so these are the best erasers to get. They're vinyl erasers, and they last a long time. If they start getting dirty, you can just take a mat knife and cut off the dirty part and toss it. Um, and I, it really works well on the soft pencils. Because that will show through a transparent dye. Now, one of the things with dyes that I like is that they are transparent so that I can still see the wood grain. Uh, but they don't have the same kind of pigment like um, I don't know if Michael Hoselick has demonstrated for you. He uses a lot of acrylic paint. And I find I, I don't love acrylic paint because it has more pigment. Once it dries, I'm stuck with it. You know, you cannot get it off. This I have a chance. Let's say I hate what I've done. Um, I can come in with plain alcohol or if it's the water and start washing it off. There's advantages. I, I like to give myself options. Let's put it that way. So, so, t 
tonight I'm going to use that. And the reason I, I like that is because I want to use just an oil finish. I will make decisions on finishes depending on the wood I'm using and what I'm going after. So like on a hardwood like maple, and if I used a, a soft color on it, I would seal it probably with a spray lacquer. But if I'm using a rough, it's really a personal kind of thing. So I never stick to one finish. Um, if I'm using something like this that has a lot of open pore, and I want a, a contrasting color to soak into the pores, which is why I chose oak in the first place, um, then I'm going to want um, to use an oil, you know, a, a, a different kind. Of I'm not going to want a hard lacquer finish. I have a personal thing that I can't stand. I can't stand shiny finishes. Um, <laughs> it's just my thing. But I know, like when I go to my Bay Area club, a lot of the guys love that really high gloss finish. To them, that's like perfect. And I find personally. It is just not something that I like. So it's a lot of it is just very subjective. OK, if you're working with dyes, you really want to wear gloves of some kind or another, something that will keep those dyes off your hands. Um, I'm pretty religious about that. I'm wearing dust masks. Um, So because this piece is rough and I've done this carving, what I want to do is an underlayer of one color and then make an oil finish glaze as a top color, in a different color, so that I'm both sealing the wood and adding color all at the same time. It's like a, a cheap way of finishing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, th yeah, they s um there's several brands on the market. Uh I know that some people like the pre-mixed like I think you can buy Balins makes pre-mixed aniline dyes. I have always preferred buying the powder and mixing my own. And I'm not sure if some of that is my cheap nature. I think I can get a lot more for my money that way. Um, but I also have more control <coughs> in my mind. I don't know. I think it's, I, I can make it thinner, thinner, thin, you know, d really dark. I suppose you can thin out the balins also. Um, there are some of the furniture makers I, I, I know who, for black, prefer shoe polish leather, you know, the leather dye. But I, I have experimented with it, and I think it has something else in it besides, it has alcohol in it, but it seems to leave a film on, on it, and I don't like that. But, you know, some of this is all personal. When I'm with some of my, you know, peers, we all disagree wholeheartedly with how we do it and what we like. And some of them can't understand what, what I'm about and why I do things that way. And I don't understand, I don't understand them. Uh, well, you ought to see what Rockler sells. I don't know what they sell. Uh, Woodcraft Supplies, or is it Woodcraft? What's the other one from New Mexico? Woodworker Supply. I used to buy a brand in San Francisco. I always like to go local, you know, where I can just, and that's why I need to live urban. Uh, I need to run out. Like right now, this isn't working. I got to go get something right now to finish this job. And there used to be a place in San Francisco that sold a dye called Long, Long, Longwoods. They're, they moved to New York. And he told me the Mosier brand that is sold at um, Woodworker Supply is his dye. 
and that you can buy it there. Um, and so one of the things with dye, like if you read their formal packages, there's a huge range for mixing. So they will say like one, one to three quarts per ounce of dye. And I'm like, one to three, that's a huge difference. So um, technically, if you're mixing these, you're going to want to um, do this by weight and not by measuring. But we're going to do, me I keep measuring spoons in my shop. We're going to do this by measuring spoons. Huh? <laughs> Listen, my husband used to complain. I took uh, my shop used to be in the basement, and then he had a dark room which he wasn't using, and I moved into there, and did my spray painting, and then I took over the guest bedroom because I didn't have enough room in those places. And then he used to say, "As long as you don't spill upstairs, <laughs> you know." So it was reversed, and he used to complain about the chips in bed. <laughs> So it's always been funny. So what I'm going to do, like if I'm mixing, let's say, these fiber dyes, unless I'm doing like when I was doing multiple, multiple pieces, I came up with a formula. There is no formula for how this works for wood. So I devised my own. Like if I used a quarter teaspoon of dye to one cup of water, I would get a standard color every time I did it. And I would make sample boards. So if I diluted it with um, two cups of water or with you know one and a half, what that color would look like so that I could repeat it. But that's when I was working you know, at the craft shows and getting orders from designers. And they would see a piece. But if I'm doing a one-off piece, I just work to what I want for that piece and not worry about it. And that's what most of you, I think, are doing. Um, but the aniline dye is a little more complicated. I mean, technically, um, it's good to mix it with warm alcohol, and you don't want to start a fire. So I, I have a hot plate, and I'll put it in a water bath. And I'll put the dye, and I'll mix this, and I'll let it sit for, you know, I'll mix that and get it dissolved for several hours. And then, you know, the next day, remix it. And sometimes you'll still find a lot of dye at the bottom of your mix. You know, you, so maybe you want to strain it. Um, there's something that can happen with aniline dyes when you mix it with alcohol called bronzing. And it really does turn bronze. And that means you've just used too much of the powder to the alcohol. But you can thin it. Um, so I've just, over the years, just come up with whatever works for me is sort of really how it is. I don't even think you can get these anymore. These are the best containers, old film cans. But they don't exist. My husband was a photographer, so I had a lot of film cans at one time. These things are wonderful. You can buy these, and you can buy lids at Costco. You can get a 1,000, <laughs> and a 1,000 lids really inexpensively. I want to get the next size, but I haven't found those. But these are wonderful when I'm doing small pieces, and I just want to mix a little paint. And um, somebody I knew even used it on his airbrush and just poked a little hole in that lid just for a small job, you know. I mean, these are, I, I use these all the time. Oh, right, <laughs> right. But where can you buy? I used to, I used to, actually, I used to save all the salad dressing ones and wash them out. Till I found out I could get, I mean, that's so stupid. Uh, Till I found I could buy a box of a thousand at Costco. Like, so this is going to be very little dye because we're not doing much of a piece. So you have to remember, we're not doing this the right way. Because if I was really, what I do at home, like actually I need to do that now, is I would mix up 
you know, I would spend a couple of nights probably and mix up like jars of this stuff. So I would mix myself up a pint or a quart of dye and then it'll last me for quite a long time. And then I have all those bottles um, in a paint cabinet. Huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, there are people, you know, each dye has different what they call fugitive qualities. And um, like a friend of mine, that's how I got started actually in fabric dyes, was she made clothing. And technically in clothing, if you're using a fabric dye, you really want it, it's a chemical reaction. It chemically seals with your, your material. So for clothing, she would, um, you know, steam it or keep it wet. So she told me I have to keep these wet for 24 hours. And I'm like, keep my wood wet for 24 hours? You're crazy. But there's a place um, in California called Dharma Trading, Dharma Dyes. They have a, a I started to type up, because I realized my list was too low of supply, too old for suppliers. But Dharma has some instructions for doing um, fabric dyes. And they said you just paint it on, you know, you just paint. Basket makers will use it, the same dye that we're using on wood for their baskets. But, you know, it's a similar material. So we're just going to make some black, and it's not going to be perfect. Do we have a place if we want to dump some of this tonight? Or what are we going to do? I'll take it home. How are we going to do that? <laughs> <laughs> do you know in England, I could not, I lived there a year and a half. I got a grant to work there. I could not find denatured alcohol. They don't have it. And what they had was this blue stuff in the hardware store. And it was tinted blue and was kind of oily because people drank the alcohol. And if I wanted really clear alcohol, I had to go to the chemist and sign a poison form that I got this surgical alcohol to mix. Some things were so funny, like things that we thought were poison, they didn't, and things they thought were poison. I, I just never could get over it. Like, I was trying to get something to clean up an oil finish, and I went to a hardware store, and they sold me something like 85% like 